right. call to order the Commerce you. Committee. We do have a quorum. We're going to go past the minutes just for a minute and move right to the bills. The first bill on the agenda is House File 2336 from Representative Greenman. I will move that House File 2336 be recommended to be re-referred to the State Government and Local Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. You have the DE5 amendment. I presume this is an author's amendment intended to get the bill in the shape you'd like us to consider it? Correct. All Thank right. you, Mr. Chair. Then I will move the DE5 amendment. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails and the DE5 is adopted. Representative Greenman to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know in the interest of time, um, I have the testifiers up here uh, with me, but I am just going to get started by saying it's great to be in commerce uh, presenting House File 2336. It's a bill that would set up the Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority, a publicly accountable, mission-driven, sustainable finance authority with the purpose of accelerating the adoption of proven clean energy technologies uh, with increased speed and scale of project implementation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The authority's essential objectives are to address the gaps in financing of clean energy and serve the communities and the markets that have been underserved uh, and most impacted by the climate crisis. As the economic, community, and financial impacts of the climate crisis grow, Minnesota must continue to make steps to accelerate our transition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition to a clean energy economy. We know that the utilities, the St. Paul Port Authority, nonprofit lenders, community banks, credit unions, and others are doing good work in Minnesota to facilitate this transition um, and energy efficiency. And we still have gaps and need to rapidly accelerate our pace of this work in Minnesota. There are projects that go unfunded and needs that are not met, from energy saving projects for affordable housing properties to district energy projects and enhanced energy efficiencies for farmers. This bill responds to those gaps and opportunities by setting up a finance authority uh, similar to green banks in other states, an entity to leverage private public dollars for significant private investment in the clean energy transition. 17 states have already um, already have energy uh, finance entities. They've used $2.5 billion to leverage $9 billion in total investments in clean energy technologies, nearly all from private lenders and investors. The Minnesota Climate Innovation Authority will strategically use state and federal dollars to leverage private investment by re reducing perceived risk, pooling projects to create investable opportunities, and partnering with Minnesota's strong ecosystem of clean energy service providers to increase the uptake of existing products and reduce barriers for underserved and low-income populations. Following the model in other states, the authority will become self-sustaining entity uh, um, within a few years, bringing in revenue to fund its operation. The bill um, that you see in the DE um, sets up an accountable, publicly accountable authority governed by 11 member board, uh, represented uh, the Department of Commerce, DEED, DLI, MPCA, and MIAC, along with six citizen members with qualifications uh, representing Minnesotans impacted by and invested in our clean energy transition. It requires the authority to develop an investment strategy and plan on the, based on the analysis of the gaps in the market and input from communities, from stakeholders, and from folks in the space. And the authority is required to come back to, and report to the legislature with detailed updates about um, the progress the community serves and the impact of the lending. And the time to do this is now. Uh, through the federal IRA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, there's $20 billion available to state-based entities to support the deployment of, of emissions reducing technology. We're still waiting on EPA guidance for how much money will be, how the money will be distributed, but back of the envelope, Minnesota per capita share would be about $350 million. That's $350 million to leverage billion dollar of private investment in our clean energy transition. Good jobs, cost savings, and a more sustainable future for Minnesota. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have uh, a two very brief testifiers to keep us on time um, on the bill. Thank you, Representative uh, Greenman. We'll move to testimony and hear from Julia Nurbon. Yes, hello. <clears throat> so I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and a leader in the Just Solar Coalition. And since 2014, we've been working to make sure that as Minnesota transitions to a carbon-free energy system, that no one is left behind. We work to help congregations and small businesses develop solar. 
Unfortunately, most of the 24 projects in our portfolio are currently tabled because they're too small to attract large financiers. We look to this finance authority to help us solve this problem and to get to yes um, on thousands of projects across the state. Um, and I'll just end by saying it's been a pleasure to work with a great diversity of organizations who support this bill, from labor, labor organizations to credit unions to native rights groups um, to solar enthusiasts. Um, all of these folks support the bill, and we're excited to move it forward. Thank you. And next we have Anjali Baines. Wonderful. Thank you, Representative Greenman, Chair and Committee members. My name is Anjali Baines, and I'm with Fresh Energy, a nonpartisan clean energy policy organization based in St. Paul that work, works often at the state legislature and in the regulatory arenas. While state programs and regulatory action are part of how we will reach the carbon-free future we need here, we also need to spur private investments and support those who are actually implementing clean energy, clean energy, whether that's energy efficiency, renewable energy, and for them to be able to do so as quickly and easily as possible. This bill does just that, and as been mentioned, this is why we and so many other organizations support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the list of testifiers who signed up to testify. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Discussion to the bill. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, Representative Agreement, it's nice to see you in front of the Commerce Committee. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Further you. discussion to the bill. Representative O'Driscoll. Again, welcome to the committee, Representative Agreement. I may not be quite as brief as Representative Dowd was. I do have some questions. I believe in you, Representative O'Driscoll. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm doing my job as you're doing your job, Mr. Chair. Um, so the question that I have as I've looked at the, the, um, the bill and the DE amendment is I understand your goal of trying to um, work in, and promote green energy, but I've noticed that in the bill that we're very lopsided. In other words, we've got a lot of government involvement, a lot of nonprofit involvement. Why don't we have any businesses, some of Minnesota's legacy Fortune 500 companies that have been around for a long time have done some uh, initiatives and done some things to be, be green and green friendly. Why are, why are we excluding them? And I say excluding because they're really not in the bill. There's not a seat for them at the table. Why are they not um, able to be contributors to the goal of what you're looking for here? Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, thank you, Lead O'Driscoll. Um, I, I don't think that's a good uh, categorization of this bill, and actually the, the whole point of things like credit enhancements and loan loss reserves, the whole point of a finance authority is to leverage public dollars, uh, state and federal public dollars, to bring in and to increase the, um, uh, um, the participation of private dollars. So things like loan loss reserves, credit enhancements that will de-risk or will allow private lenders who sometimes are on a shorter term, um, sometimes they won't be attracted to smaller projects like we heard. Um, this will allow um, the, the authority to actually work with private lenders um, and, and other kinds of lenders uh, uh, to bring them into that, the space. Um, does that answer your question? Representative O'Driscoll? You have to look, Mr. Chair, you know I'd have a follow-up. I, do, we I, do work I well know together. you well. <laughs> we do work well together. Uh, well, Representative Greenman, I draw your attention to subdivision 10, lines 9.28. Um, through um, to the top of the next page, and let's just let's just um, bring it to um, lines 10.22. I don't see any space in there for private folks. If you're saying that they don't want to participate in this, wouldn't it be better to get them in at ground level and get a chance to start talking about why they, they see barriers and the like to be able to uh, to help assist with the leverage on this that, uh, that your bill is purporting to um, bring forward here? I'll, I'll turn to Representative Greenman, but I'm kind of puzzled by by this because I. I see that some of the governor's appointments are specifically reserved for people with expertise in financing projects at a community bank, credit union, community development institution. That's lines 10.10, 10.11, and line 10.14 to 15 says one member with expertise in investment fund management or financing and deploying clean energy technologies. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You um, said what I was going to say. Uh, there's board members here who absolutely could be uh, those expertise um, that you're talking about. I'm sorry, Mr. Representative Chair. Crystal. I'm sorry, my, my comments were about a more global, why aren't we bringing businesses in other than investment to say here's what we'd be looking for as entrepreneurs, here's what we're looking for to be able to try to do this. That's what I'm referring to. Not necessarily people in the investment or in the finance area. I just wanted to know why we don't have a broader coalition of folks to kind of help balance this out. 
Representative Grima. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and thank you, uh, um, uh, Representative Driscoll. And I really appreciate that. I, I've spent a lot of time here uh, thinking about the input, the process, and the consultation because I think what we want to get right is that we're identifying market gaps, we're identifying places that the market and people and communities that the market is not currently serving, and places where we want um, to to expand the scope and scale of technology. So I'm happy to look at um, look through the bill with you um, um, about where you think that there's there's more input, but I actually think that the consultation and um, the stakeholder process is pretty open uh, to small businesses, to, to clean energy um, entrepreneurs, and to folks in the finance space. Final comment, Mr. Representative Chair. Representative O'Driscoll. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Greenman. Um, thank you for being here with us again this evening. <laughs> I, I just don't see any dedicated spots that we can hope that there'll be appointments and, and wish that there are appointments, but there's no guaranteed space in the in the bill and in the committee formation and the board formation to be able to bring that private sector people who are actually innovators into to this not the finances but the innovators in these different areas so thank you mr. chair and representative Greenman. Representative Greenman, closing comments on the bill um, thank you mr. chair and I appreciate the discussion um, and your um, and your feedback um, I would just say that this is an authority that will allow us to mobilize um, uh, private capital um, and leverage uh, uh, private capital to expand access um, and um, um, accelerate the adoption of clean energy technology Greenhouse, greenhouse glass, greenhouse glass reduction uh, technology, especially looking at communities that have been uh, left out, communities that have been impacted by climate change, and markets that are not being served. So, uh, with that, I think it's a great, um, it's a really important opportunity for Minnesota, um, given the federal money on the table. Um, and I'd ask for your support. All right. Thank you, Representative Greenman. I will renew my motion that House File 2336, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the State Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion no. prevails, and House File 2336, as amended, is recommended to be re-referred to the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, next, <laughs> the next item on our agenda is House File 1706 from Representative Edelson. And as Representative Edelson comes uh, to the table, I will move House File 1706 be recommended to be, oh, you know what, we were going to do the minutes. Yes. And I even uh, talked to you about that in between, then yeah. I forgot. Uh, so before we do that, uh, Representative Katiza Watoon, do you have a motion? I would move approval of the minutes from yesterday, March 6th. Representative Katiza Watoon moves approval of the minutes from March 6th, 2023. Any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails uh, in the minutes from March 6, uh, 2023 are approved. We will now move to your bill, House File 1706, uh, which I will move uh, is recommended to be re-referred to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Edelson, to your bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, I also have a, um, an A1 amendment. You have the A1 amendment. Yes, we have, that's right, yeah. And uh, the A1 amendment is just an agreement um, to to strike language that we initially put in the bill that was part of a larger compromise a few years ago um, that adds value-based uh, care. Okay, so we have the A1 amendment. I will move uh, the A1 amendment. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. A1 is adopted. Now, Representative Olson. your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I know with deadline, everybody wants to kind of be exact to what is in this bill and 1706 that is actually uh, before your committee, which would be um, sections one through three, um, specifically making it so that uh, people may use audio um, for telehealth uh, or for, for services. Um, so I guess telehealth services. Um, and I think that is the, the biggest section of the bill. I, I maybe uh, Ms. Abder Holden wants to elaborate a little bit. Welcome back to the committee. Uh and state your name, proceed your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. Um, telephonic care has really been a boon to people with mental illnesses. Um, they don't often have smartphones if you're really poor, if they've lost it because perhaps they've been homeless. Um, they might live in places where you don't actually have broadband, you can't get internet. And so it's proven to be really helpful <laughs> because they can, in a crisis, they can call their therapist, which this language allows. Um, but even for just regular appointments, people have actually preferred that. Now, every now and then, we would like to have the person meet, you know, in person uh, with the therapist. But it really has proven to be effective. And if I think, if you think about it, therapy is about talking. And so doing it by phone or doing it, you know, 
um, by audio, by video. Either way, you're really getting this kind of the same care. So we really support this. Um, there are lots of other good things in the bill, but I think, uh, again, knowing that you've got other bills up tonight, unless you really want me to, I can go through the other sections. Appreciate the offer, uh, and, and maybe we can talk <laughs> more about it offline. <laughs> next, uh, uh, the next aspire is Dan Andreessen. Like Mr. Andreessen, if you want to come down and uh, state your name for the record, proceed to your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. Um, so just some, some comments on the bill. So there is universal agreement that all forms of telehealth are useful tools to deliver health care remotely. And all council member plans cover telehealth, including services product provided by video and audio only communication. The only issue of disagreement is reimbursement parity between in-person and telehealth services. Reimbursement parity is, is essentially industry jargon for um, a provider is allowed to charge a patient the same amount for a telehealth visit as an in-person visit. And the changes in Section 1, Subdivision 2H will add phone calls to that list. And this is not just for behavioral health, but this is for all providers. Uh, so what this means is that if your provider charges you $300 for a in-office visit, they can also now charge you $300 for a phone call. Parity was temporarily expanded to phones because of the pandemic to ensure patients could maintain access to providers. And this is set to end soon, and there's insufficient evidence to demonstrate the benefits of healthcare delivered over the phone to justify continuing parity. CMS has indicated that it's no longer going to cover audio only services in Medicare after the PHE due to the concerns over effectiveness and quality. The other aspect of parity argument is the potential impact telehealth has on overall healthcare spending. We're all looking for solutions to address the continual rise in healthcare costs, and evidence shows that there's going to be savings with telehealth. We agree providers should be paid for their expertise, but also likely that it's also likely that overall cost to provide care through the phone or video chat is less expensive than delivering care in a clinic. Payment parity means that savings from telehealth are kept by providers rather than passed on to their patients through lower medical bills. If the opposite is true, if that telehealth, telehealth added costs, we would expect these costs to be passed on to patients through higher medical bills and reimbursement payments. For any business, we're expected to expect those to, uh, entities to pass on their savings to consumers. As nonprofit health plans, with the same expectation is on us. In fact, passing any savings to enrollees um, is required by both federal and state law. Providers don't have these same requirements. And now we have heard from now we've had we've heard from providers that the cost of telehealth and in-person care is the same. Well, we may have to agree to disagree on that. But let's just say that it's true today. Is that going to be true for next year, in five years, in 10 years? If there's ever savings in the future, the provider will always be allowed to keep those savings because of parity, and it's going to incentivize them to find those financial efficiencies because they're going to be able to keep those savings. <coughs> Once we put a law in place at a certain level of reimbursement, it's very hard to undo it. Parity also has an impact to patient access by not mandating parity and providing virtual care options at different price points more patients can ac access these services that fits their needs and their budget. Now, lastly, as health insurers, we're asked to find ways to lower our cost of premiums, out-of-pockets, and deductibles. However, when we find a way to lower costs, such as finding savings in, health, in telehealth, we're told we can't do this by providers. So if this is not something that we can use to lower costs, we ask, what, is, what are we going to do instead? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the people who signed up to testify. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify as to this bill? Please come forward, state your name for the record, proceed to your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, Dave Renner with the Minnesota Medical Association. First, just want to say we strongly support this bill and, and thank uh, Representative Edelman. I just want to clarify something that Mr. Andreessen just said. This bill does not change current law related to parity. So current law already says that you charge charge the same for telehealth versus in-person health. This law does makes no, this bill makes no changes to that. So this law, this bill is just trying to clarify that audio only care should be continued as telehealth. We've heard also from our members, not just in mental health, but, but across in those areas where telehealth is effective, in most cases, audio uh, only is also very effective. So we strongly support this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will turn to member discussion and questions. Representative Katiza Batoon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Edelson, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I, I think uh, the last testifier who um, spoke and clarified a little bit on, on what this bill is about really hit the nail on the head because I, I have um, had separate conversations with the um, with Mr. Andreessen, and, and you know, if there are if there are real measurable savings that are able to be recouped. Um, example, you know, I had a baby in 2020 in the middle of a global pandemic. And I went through some postpartum challenges, and it was even if I, you know, would have felt safe or been able to leave my house and meet with a therapist in person, it would have been really hard to do so with a newborn at home. Um, and so, uh, for me, having access to, to telehealth services and um, it was really, it was really impactful, and I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity. I think that people who don't have a smartphone, who aren't able to connect to the internet on a on a regular, reliable basis, um, should have that same opportunity. And so, the the audio part of this is very important. That being said, you know, I went through a lot of Kleenex in that time <laughs> during these sessions. So, I mean, Kleenex, other things, staffing in the clinic. I mean, if there are costs that that can be trimmed down based on the amount of people, the amount of um, patients seeking these audio or telehealth services, I think we should keep an eye on that and, and just make sure that down the line, um, mm. if, there are, if there are savings that can be found, they should, we should just keep, make, make sure that that is, is something that um, is top of mind. But thank you for bringing the bill forward. I think it's important. Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you. Um, and I, I want to go to Ms. Abderholden, excuse me, it's been a long day, um, has a few comments too, but I, I just want to say, um, I know, you know, there was a there was a comment by the health plans. If it doesn't lower costs, then you know what what's the purpose? Is the purpose of healthcare is to make sure people get the care they need. And actually, if we get them earlier healthcare, um, it actually saves us costs down the road. So I, I think that we can't lose sight of that. And then, uh, uh, Ms. Abderholden, if if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Chair. Of course, Ms. Abderholden. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The one thing I want to mention is that when you look at the costs of mental health care, it's the person. Right, it's the therapist providing their time. It isn't a lot of equipment or anything like that. And so the amount of time that they're spending with that person, whether it's in person, telehealth, or by phone, their cost doesn't change, right? Because it's their, their time, um, which is valuable, um, and, and the training that they received. So I just wanna say we're not gonna see a lot of cost savings there um, because you don't have a lot of equipment in a therapist's office. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Edelson, um, for the for the bill. Um, I do have a question about the medical transport portion of the bill. On line 7.24 and 7.25, um, there is a change, this $75 for the base rate for the first 100 miles and an additional $75 for trips over 100 miles and, and the $2.40 per mile for protected transport. Um, why, why are both of those finite numbers? I understand, it, it makes sense to me to have the base rate. It makes sense to me to have the additional per mile. It seems odd that we would have $75 for the first 100 miles, but if it is 101 miles, it is 150 bucks, or if it's 200 miles, it's 150 bucks. Should, would it make more sense to have that uh, variable? That seems like an odd provision here and not in line with any of the other transport costs. Representative Edelson. Uh, Ms. Abdul. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative. The reason is because for protected transport, once you hit 100 miles, you have to add another staff person um, to the vehicle. Um, because if the, you're going, if you're taking someone from emergency room, you know, 130 miles to the next hospital, um, you might have to stop along the way. The person may have to use the restroom or whatever. You you are going to need two people, and so that's why we up the cost for that. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair, and that is a great reason. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Cleveland. Thank you. I don't know which microphone is mine. Um, so, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if this goes to you, Representative Edelson, so I'll start with you, and if you want to hand it off, great. Um, today is Deaf and Hard of Hearing Day at the Capitol. So when we are thinking about audio services, would this also include texting for those who are hard of hearing or have hearing loss? Or I deaf? see Representative Edelson looking at Ms. Mm -hmm. Abderholden. Do you want to go, for, you want me to, Ms. Abderholden? I don't know. Um, 
Mr. Okay. Chairman, I'm not sure that, Representative, I'm not sure that it includes texting, but there are ways when you're making phone calls, when you're deaf or hard of hearing, where it's, you know, um, kind of translated, if you yeah. will. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that that would be covered because you're using a telephone to be able to do that. Would it be covered? Representative oh, Cleveland. Apologies, okay. Chair. You're fine. Would it be covered if we don't adopt this? Ms. Abdul. Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, if we're not covering telephonic, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, but I'm actually not going to be able to answer that question. I will um, research it and find out. Okay, but I, I don't want to answer wrongly off the top of my head. Representative Cleveland. Right, and then one last question, and this has to do with aging. As Minnesota ages. Um, and we are dealing more and more with isolation and the need for um, services to people who may not have mobility uh, easily available to them transportation. Um, do we, are we anticipating that we will have more and more of these uh, audio services needed? Representative Edelson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that would be a safe assumption, uh, Representative Cleborn. I think it's a good question, but I think it's this is you know the goal is to try to expand people's ability to to get the services they need. So the hope is we would do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right. Closing comments, Representative Edelson. Please support the bill. Oh, well, actually, that. it's referring, but yes. And with that, I will renew my motion that House File 1706, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. And House File 1706, is, as amended, is recommended to be re-referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. All right. And we are going to go next to uh, House File 2429. Uh, from Representative Kraft. Representative Kraft, when you are situated, you can go ahead and move your bill. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. I move that uh, House File 2429 be um, laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Kraft moves House File 2429 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Kraft, to your bill. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I'm pleased to bring before you House File 2429 on climate risk disclosure for financial institutions. When people think about climate change, the first things that often come to mind are increasing severe weather, droughts, forest fires, ocean warming, fossil fuels, and impacts on the natural world. But it is having and will continue to have a huge impact on our financial markets. A 2020 report from the Commodities Futures Trading Commission titled Managing Climate Risk in the U.S. Financial System stated, and I quote, climate change poses a major risk to the stability of the U.S. financial system and to its ability to sustain the American economy. Also, in 2020, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, wrote a public letter to business CEOs and said that, quote, climate change has become the defining factor in companies' long-term prospects. He went on to say, questions on how climate change will impact cities, businesses, and our economy are driving a profound reassessment of risk and asset values. And because capital markets pull future risk forward, we will see changes in capital allocation more quickly than we see changes to the climate itself. He makes the point that climate risk is investment risk. The U.S. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency today on their website states that climate-related financial risks have the potential to affect the safety and soundness of banks. And this office has taken on the role to ensure that national banks and federal savings associations understand their climate-related financial risks and develop risk management frameworks and capabilities to identify, measure, monitor, and control those risks. Now, financial risks from climate change are not confined to national banks, but can be found in banks of all sizes. A December 2022 article in the Wall Street Journal reports how New York's 
New York State's banking regulator has a proposal that would have financial institutions of all sizes evaluate climate risks throughout their businesses. The New York Department of Financial Services said that small banks might even be more susceptible in some ways than their larger counterparts. It said, quote, smaller organizations are not necessarily less exposed to climate-related financial risk because they may have concentrated business lines or geographies that are highly exposed to climate-related financial risks without the risk mit mitigating benefit of diversification available to larger organizations. So with that background, this is a very simple bill to have banks and credit unions over one half billion of assets assess their climate risk annually with a survey developed by the Department of Commerce. This is something that the insurance industry does today and has been doing for many years. This is about understanding and uncovering risks to the very foundations of our economy, which is key to be able to anticipate issues that are absolutely coming. Now, this bill will be laid over, and I know there are questions and concerns on it. I've heard them from some of the key stakeholders and had initial conversations with them. I'm sure you may hear some of them from people that I think will be testifying. I view this as the beginning of an important conversation, and I look forward to working through these over the coming weeks. Thank you, Representative Kraft. Uh, no one signed up to testify, ah, okay. so I will ask if there are any members of the public wishing to testify. I believe I see Mr. Smith wishes to testify, so I will encourage him to come forward. And Or Mr. Smith's guest. Come forward, state your name for the record, proceed your testimony. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chair and members. Proceed. Thank you. State your name for the record, then you can proceed your testimony. Sure, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> My name is John Wenland. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel at Minco Credit Union, and I'm here to testify on this bill, or on this house file. Minco Credit Union is a state chartered credit union. We're located or headquartered in Cambridge, Minnesota, with about approximately 100 employees. We just opened our seventh branch, and we have just over $500 million in assets. Reading through the language of this bill raises many questions for financial institutions like Minco. The bill would require banks and credit unions with assets of $500 million or more to complete an annual climate risk survey developed by the Department of Commerce. It's unclear what this survey would look like, what data, if any, would have to collect either from our institutions or from our members, or even what climate risks we would be compelled to assess. We also don't know what the purpose or extent of this survey will be, what the full burden on our institution would be, including staff time needed to respond. With the always increasing regulatory burden, we are all already under, I have serious concerns adding more burden without fully understanding the reasons behind the survey and the work it will entail. It's also unclear why financial institutions have been singled out in this legislation, when many other companies across dozens of industries in Minnesota would have far greater potential environmental impacts. It also puts state chartered financial institutions like Minco at a competitive disadvantage with our federally chartered cohorts, since this proposed legislation's legislation would not apply to them. It's also important to note that similar proposals in other states and by other regulatory agencies have a very different approach. The National Bank's regulator, the OCC, is proposing climate requirements for banks over $100 billion in assets. The National Credit Union Administration is not proposing rules at this time, owing to the smaller average asset size of credit unions. California, California and New York, in looking to implement similar legislation, are not solely applying their requirements to financial institutions but are directing this at companies with more than $1 billion in revenue, not by measuring assets, which we believe makes much more sense. I strongly encourage, you, or encourage the committee to not consider House File 2429 in its current form. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. You're welcome. All right, I see no other people seeking to speak, so we'll move to member discussion to the bill. Actually, first, we do have an amendment. I apologize. I believe it's from Representative Farr. Representative Farr, do you want to move the A-1 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A-1 amendment. Representative Farr moves the A-1 amendment. Representative Farr. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Kraft. So um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the OCC and, and I know that the testifier brought it up as well. They're considering doing the same thing at a level of $100 billion um, versus 50 or $500 million, half of a billion. So um, mine, is, mine is pretty simple just to raise the threshold that we would require this to uh, simply $1 billion rather than the 500 million. Representative Kraft, I'm sorry, we were <laughs> distracted up here at the front of the room, but Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the amendment, um, Representative Farr. Um, you know, I, I would dispute something. New York, the New York uh, regulator has made clear that they're looking at a proposal to deal with all institutions, all bank institutions of all sizes. Um, that said, I think it's premature right now to, I appreciate the spirit of, of your amendment. I've had conversations with some of the folks in the industry and I understand those concerns. I'm not re rejecting them out of hand, but I think it's premature to make an adjustment to this and I'll uh, commit to working with you and, and others over the coming weeks. So with that, I would ask for a no vote on the amendment. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Farr, thank you for bringing the amendment. And I think that it's prudent to, to have this amendment, and you're asking for like one one-hundredth of what's being proposed by the OCC. One one-hundredth as the threshold that the OCC is putting forward. Doubling what's in the bill, but still one one-hundredth of what's being asked for federally chartered institutions to do versus um, state institutions. And I think it makes pretty good sense to, to try to put that number at a workable level. Uh, because as I read the bill, it says that the department is going to collect information, but it doesn't say what the department is going to do with the information. It's not going to be posted anywhere. It's not going to be made available in a report to the, to the legislature. They're just going to collect that information. And so to put all of these institutions through completing and processing and delivering this information, where the department's just going to collect the information and not make it public or do anything with it, seems like we would want to respect the businesses and say, you know what, let's, let's get some data, but let's go with the bigger institutions that maybe have a better read on what's going on, provide some relief to, to smaller uh, depositories. So, Representative Farr, I, I support your amendment. I think it's a great amendment. Again, because the bill doesn't tell us what they're going to do with the data once they have it. So let's get some data and, and provide some relief to, um, to banks and to credit unions. Representative Kraft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative O'Driscoll. As I said, I think it's premature to accept this kind of an amendment. Uh, I did hear maybe you were making, making a, a more, uh, excuse me, an oral amendment to have the department post this information online. Um, but I would say that's also premature right now. As I said, I'm committed to work on this um, and to bring folks um, and to talk through these issues. But for now, I uh, remain urging a no vote. Okay, Reverend Driscoll, I'll go back to you. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, if we're going to have an evening meeting, we may as well have some, some yeah. <laughs> open, <laughs> frank discussions. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it'd be inappropriate for me to make an uh, 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 oral amendment on the bill since we're on the amendment. But I would be open to an oral amendment to putting it at what the OCC is considering for um, Minnesota chartered institutions, if you are open to that. Representative Kraft. <laughs> uh, Chair Stevenson, Representative O'Driscoll, I am not, but thank you. Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Kraft, you've, you've said a couple of times that it's premature. I'm wondering, what do you want to see? What do you want, what information do you want to have to be able to make this kind of a decision? Representative Kraft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Brindley. Uh, I'm sorry, can you clarify what information to make what kind of decision? Representative Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You've said that it is premature to to change this from uh, from a half a billion to a billion dollars, which again would be one one hundredth of of you know for our state institutions. Um, what what do you want to see to be able to make that decision? Representative Kraft. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Brindley. Uh, so I want to have a full discussion with the stakeholders. Um, they've raised some issues about what uh, half a billion r uh, r means in terms of size. I want to understand a, a bit, bit more about that in their point of view. So it may be that a billion is the right number. It may be that a different approach is the right number. But I think this is the starting point. Representative Brindley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you help us understand who these stakeholders are that are working on this? Representative Kraft. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Brindley, uh, I met today with the folks from the credit unions, from the banking industry, um, and I think there was one other group in there. Representative New Brindley, and, and to the amendment uh, now, I mean, you certainly can ask uh, Representative Kraft about stakeholders beyond that, but let's try and stick to the amendment for the moment. Well, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, although we were told that we're not taking the amendment because we want to talk to stakeholders, so that's why it's relevant. Um, so are they the only stakeholders, the only stakeholders that have any interest in this bill? Because I assume if they're the only stakeholders, they'd be just fine with you taking the amendment or not offering the legislation at all. So I'm just wondering who the other stakeholders are. Okay, and we'll do one more question on stakeholders, but then we are gonna kind of move on to just the substance of the amendment. Representative Kraft. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative New Brindley. Well, uh, certainly the Department of Commerce would be another stakeholder, and then anyone else who wants to come talk to me about this. Okay. Representative New Brindley, did you have a, a, a different question as to the amendment or discussion to the amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think we're going to get an answer on who the stakeholders are who want this bill. <laughs> I, I think he did answer the question. <laughs> Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Representative Kraft. Um, I, I just I also want to just highlight that that banks do consider climate risk. Uh, we, you know, they risk rate every credit. Uh, certainly, in agricultural credits, that climate risk is considered in in every individual credit. So this. Um, you know, this is happening at a lower level in banks all the time. Uh, I appreciate you um, telling me that you will work with me on this as I as I dug into this a little deeper, and I, and I hate to say that I want to be more like California, but um, I think California has a better approach to this, and, and the testifier uh, mentioned that, and that's revenue, not asset size. So I'd, I'd like to have that discussion with you in the future, and um, if, if indeed this gets voted down tonight, um, and so thank you very much. All right. And with that, uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Uh, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion to the bill. <laughs> Representative Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, um, I guess what I'd like to do, since we did get some discussion going on collecting the information, and it was very important to leave it at about $500 million. I see that we have someone from the department in the audience. I'd like to ask them to maybe come down and shed some light on for us. You know, what would they do with all this information that they don't have to make public or put as a report? What, what purpose would they have in collecting that information, and why would they need it? Uh, I think we have a couple people from uh, the department. Mr. Kelly, I don't know if you want to come down or if you want to... I will note, uh, as Mr. Kelly is coming down, just that um, subdivision two of both sections one and two indicate that the data submitted to the commissioner would be public, except for the trade secret information that's non-public. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I might, it doesn't Driscoll. require them to make it public. Someone would have to ask for it. So it's not being voluntarily or required by the legislation or anything to put it on there. If someone knew that this data existed, they could contact the department, I would suspect. But Mr. Kelly may be able to shed some more light on like, that for Representative us. Driscoll was just really eager to offer that amendment to publish all this data, <laughs> Representative Kraft. Mr. Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is John Kelly. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, I uh, this. There are institutions that do climate reporting uh, on a voluntary basis to the Department of Commerce. Currently, insurance uh, companies have been doing climate reporting uh, for nearly a decade. Um, this data is public. Um, it is submitted. The Academy of Actuaries and the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, uh, they have a research arm. They've analyzed the data, and they provided analysis to states on an individual basis. That data is also public. Um, I think that uh, you know the data could be used to inform regulatory oversight of financial institutions, but that's not called out in the bill. But in terms of the classification of the data, the the bill calls for us to receive it currently, and it's public. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Kelly. Um, did the part did, has the department asked for information? Uh, on this or the need to collect this? Is that why the legislation is here? Is this from uh, department driven? Mr. Kelly. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Driscoll, no, this is not a department-led initiative. 
Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just to review the facts, we're collecting information from financial institutions that can be made public and is available if you ask and the department isn't asking for the information, but we're, we're going to move the bill and lay it over for possible inclusion on information that we don't know what we're going to do with for parties that didn't ask for it. Did I miss anything? <laughs> you got it. Summed it up real well. yep. <laughs> Further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, Representative Kraft, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so climate change is impacting all aspects of society, including our financial system, and that will only increase in the future. This is an important bill, an important discussion to have to protect the integrity of Minnesota's financial system. All right. And with that, I will renew Representative Kraft's motion that House File 2429 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and the bill is laid over. We'll next move to uh, House File 2413 from Representative Norris. And as Representative Norris comes to the table, I will move House File 2413 be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. I will also move the A3 amendment, which Representative Norris, I assume, is an author's amendment getting the bill in the shape you'd like the committee to consider. Is that correct? It is, Chair Stevenson. All right. Discussion to the amendments. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails and the A3 is adopted. Representative Norris, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Stevenson and members. It's great to be with you for the first time here in the Commerce Committee. Um, Chair Stevenson and members, 95% of abusive relationships involve some form of financial abuse. And this bill is designed to protect the victims of this financial abuse while helping creditors attempt to recover the coerced debt from the perpetrator of that abuse. Coerced debt, which is addressed in this bill, includes situations like the following. Uh, an abuser stealing a victim's identity and using it to incur debt. Or maybe forcing a victim to take on debt through uh, the threat of force, intimidation, undue influence, harassment, fraud, deception, or, or coercion. Or perhaps causing a victim to go into debt by prohibiting them from working. The victims in these situations may be victims of domestic abuse, harassment, sex, or labor trafficking. This bill allows a victim to seek equitable relief to either A, prohibit a creditor from holding or attempting to hold that debtor liable for the coerced debt, or B, dismissing any cause of action uh, brought by a creditor to enforce or collect the coerced debt from the debtor. I want to thank Ron Elwood for his masterful work bringing together all the stakeholders to find a solution on this bill that protects Minnesotans who become victims of financial abuse. All right, and with that, we'll turn to Mr. Elwood. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. I really want to thank Representative Norris for carrying this really important bill. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our coalition partners, Violence Free Minnesota, Standpoint, and Mincasa, all of whom have worked with us to get to where we are right now. Um, very quickly, I'll just kind of walk you through the bill. I mean, the, the main point, uh, the main section of this bill really is on page um, four, at four, starting at 4.1. And the, the central point of this is to give the uh, survivor a legal remedy, a legal path to show by providing documentation and evidence, and they're all defined up, up in the definition section, um, to show that the debt that they've incurred was not incurred voluntarily, it was forced, and that uh, they asked the court uh, if they can show for by a preponderance of evidence that this is the case to uh, declare that debt not to be owed by that person. And then uh, in that same section, there's a provision that would provide that the debt, the, uh, the abuser, the person who caused the debt, the liability can be uh, shifted to that person provided they are joined to the proceeding. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but we do have another testifier. All right, so I think next we will go to Shanika Chambers. Uh, State your name for the record, proceed your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Shanika Chambers, Program Manager or Policy Program Manager for Violence Free Minnesota. Um, chair and members of the committee, um, I 
work with Violence Free Minnesota, the Coalition to End Relationship Abuse. We are a statewide organization with over 80 member programs who provide advocacy and services to domestic and sexual assault victims across the state. Today, I am testifying in support of HF 2413, a bill that would provide remedies for survivors who have fallen victim to coercive debt. Victim survivors face many obstacles and challenges on their journey to overcome abuse. Through coercive control, an abuser may use intimidation, violence, and isolation to restrict and control a victim survivor's autonomy and freedom, um, including a survivor's economic freedom. Um, up to 99% of domestic violence victims experience economic abuse, such as coercive debt. Um, during an abusive relationship and during an abusive relationship and finance is often cited as the biggest barrier to leaving an abusive relationship. Through coercion and manipulation, abusers incur debt in a victim survivor's name that would not have incurred that they would not have incurred otherwise. This leaves a snowball effect of rising debt and lifelong impacts and collateral consequences for victim survivors. Some victim survivors won't realize that they were a victim of coercive debt until after they leave an abuser. Um, throughout the course of an abusive relationship, an abuser may take out a home loan, a vehicle loan, or apply for credit cards in that victim's name, damaging their ability to be approved for new housing or apply for a loan due to their current credit, current credit and history of debt. While this form of abuse affects victims no matter what their socioeconomic status is, race or gender identity may be, it affects the lives of marginalized communities in a much more unique and systematic way. Because black and Latino women have already faced, have already faced credit discrimination, the consequences and damages presumed from coercive debt can be debilitating and almost impossible to bounce back from. House File 2413 would serve as a means to help these survivors move ahead and rebuild their lives. It would provide a legal path to have these unwanted and unfair debts declared extinguished as far as the survivor is concerned. This bill is an important step forward to protect survivors of relationship abuse, and we urge, that, we urge you all to vote um, yes on House File 2413. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That uh, concludes the people who signed up to testify. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Norris. So as I understand the bill, uh, a creditor would have a right to seek payment recovery from the person who caused the debtor to incur coerced debt. <laughs> and the debtor with the coerced debt would have the right to withhold that person's name for their safety. So where does that leave the creditor then? Representative, uh, Mr. Elwood. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Farr, the court can take uh, specific uh, steps to protect the survivor, but if, so the name of the of the abuser could be in a non-public uh, filing, it could be um, uh, confidential, but the creditor would be able to obtain the information, it would have to be in the petition. Uh, so the, what that means, what you're asking at is that it doesn't have to be public, but it can be accessed by the creditor to be able to uh, uh, go after the abuser, if Perfect that makes part. any sense. Yes, thank you for that. And so, you know, in, I mean, there's nothing, I, mean, I certainly want to respect that person's privacy, but if that creditor then is going to go try and get a judgment against that individual. I just, I'm concerned with, are we gonna be able to do that then without naming that person, with be, being able to keep themselves, keep that private? Representative Elwood, Mr. Elwood. <laughs> Sometimes it really <laughs> feels that way, doesn't it? Mr. Elwood. Mr. Chair and Representative Farr, that's embarrassing. Um, but, um, I, I don't think I was clear. What I'm suggesting is the name can be withheld publicly from the petition, but it is available to the creditor through other mechanisms. So it just wouldn't be public so that the uh, address of the victim wouldn't be public for the abuser to find them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Mr. Elwood, you misheard me. It wasn't embarrassing. I didn't call you Senator Elwood. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Representative Norris, final words. 
Thank you, Chair Stevenson, and I again want to just thank all the stakeholders who, who came together on this, the, the Minnesota Credit Union Network, uh, there's a letter of support from them in your packet, uh, the Minnesota Bankers Association, Great Lakes Credit and Collections Association, Consumer Credit Data Industry, Equifax, and InBank. Uh, I think everybody came together for a real common sense bill that's going to uh, protect uh, victims uh, and also make sure uh, that the, the creditors can, can go after the folks who, who perpetrated uh, this abuse. And so I'm, I'm really pleased with this bill and, and uh, encourage uh, a green vote from the committee. All right. I will renew uh, my motion that House File 2413 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, and House File 2413, as amended, is recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Thank you, Representative Norris. The last bill on our agenda tonight is House File 2325 from Representative Cha. Once you are situated, Representative Cha, yes, go ahead you. and move your bill. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. I'd like to move HF 2325 to be lowered for possible inclusion. I think, Representative Shaw, I think we're going to move this one to the general register, if that's okay with you. That is fine, Chair. All right. So, Representative Shaw moves House File 2325 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Representative Shaw, to your bill. Thank you, Chair. HF 2325 is to give relief to Minnesota banks. Section 1 of uh, this bill is to amend current statute to allow state charter banks to operate branches on a part-time basis, allowing branches to be closer, closed up to 48 consecutive hours. Current law generally requires banks' uh, locations to be open from Monday through Friday unless there is exception, such as a holiday or an emergency. Currently, electronic banking and ATM machines are widely available, allowing consumers to access banking services 24-7. HF 2325 would prevent the closing of some rural branches that would be staffed, that can't be staffed full-time. Section 2 of HF 2325 would repeal an outdated statute in association rules requiring state charter banks to pay for an expensive director's audit. The audit addresses errors that examiners are already covering. Most states do not have such requirements. Larger bank banks must still also perform director's audit under federal requirements, and this would help change state charter community banks and provide parity with their national bank peers. Um, and then Section 2 would still currently um, require the Department of Commerce would retain the authority to require a director's audit. At this time, I'd like to yield uh, my time to my testifier, Teresa Cuvas from Minnesota Bankers Association. I think, uh, it's see be Ms. Rice is at the table here, so I think we'll go to uh, Ms. Rice next. Uh, Tess Rice, you can state your name for the record, receive your testimony. Chair Stevenson, committee members, my name is Tess Rice. I'm MBA's General Counsel, Minnesota Bankers Association. Uh, we represent most of the banks in Minnesota, from the largest to the very smallest. Um, I won't rehash all of this, but basically it's two things that are kind of outdated. One is that state chartered banks, not national banks, but state chartered banks are required to be open Monday through Friday, unless there's an emergency or a holiday. National banks don't have that requirement. They can set their own hours. It's starting to become a bigger deal because there's not as much traffic in banks anymore. What with um, online banking and ATMs and that kind of thing, they're seeing a lot less traffic, but their option is only to either staff it full time or close it. And nobody wants their bank to close, especially in rural areas. I mean, I think they're really important on Main Street. So um, this just gives them some flexibility to keep that branch open. So they could be closed up to two days in a row total. So people will still be able to access that location and there will be a location that's open, but this just gives them some flexibility. And the other part is this director's audit. Um, <coughs> We've talked to the Department of Commerce about it. They don't use it. Um, they don't want, they don't need it. They're doing this work themselves, but banks are having to pay a third party auditor to come and do it. So it costs, you know, eight to 10,000 for a very small bank to do this audit that no one cares about. So um, we'd like to have them not do it. National banks do not have to do it until they're of the size of 500 million in assets. Same with um, the federal requirements for state chartered banks. They have to do it at 500 million, million. So there is an advantage to national banks having their charter in Minnesota because they don't, those small ones don't have to get this audit. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Brian Smith on the list. Mr. Smith, are you wanting to testify? Works for me. 
Uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify as to this bill? Seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Representative Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Chop. Um, it's a great bill. I appreciate you bringing this forward, and I urge a uh, yes vote. Representative Leibling. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Cha, for this bill. I'm just curious, maybe the testifier can say, why, why was this requirement in law in the first place? It just seems really arbitrary. Ms. Rice? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, I looked it up, and I think this one was from 1945, so I don't know. You know, there, remember It's a Wonderful Life when they were worried about that bank being closed? People really wanted, you know, they didn't want their bank to be closed and them not to be able to get their money. And I think this was part of that. The Department of Commerce probably has a better idea, but that's no, my guess. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm very sorry that um, Representative Ann New Brindley is out of the room. I made a bet with her years ago that I would find a bill that we, she and I could both be on. And now she's not even in the room for me to gloat. So oh, thank you. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If Mr. Smith would come out, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you, Representative Cha, for bringing this bill forward. And I think that you were spot on, um, uh, Ms. Rice, when you say that the, the genesis behind this is the bank closed and the idea of the run of the bank, the Great Depression and things. If people see their bank is closed and it's closed again, that starts rumors around town and then you get the, the panic. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Um, People who are younger than me, and there's more and more of them every day, um, don't want to go to a bricks and mortar bank. They don't want to have a paper check. They don't want to have those kinds of kinds of things. They'd much rather do banking in a mobile environment. And so, um, to what you've said, and to what Representative Farr has said, um, I think it also allows those to have a brick and mortar for those customers who are interested, and they're just going to need to know the schedule. And we don't close those banks and uh, put those folks out of business and jobs. And it still meets a community need in, um, on multiple levels. And we all know that uh, your industry, along with all the other industries, are having difficulty finding um, labor and staff to be able to work. And this is an accommodation that's long overdue. And I also would encourage a yes vote on this bill. That's not because I'm the number two author on it. It's because Representative Claiborne and I are on this bill together. All right. Any closing comments, Representative Cha? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Stevenson. Thank you, um, Honorary Leader Drisco and uh, Representative Farr, and uh, for the bipartisan support on this bill. And uh, let's uh, give some relief to our Minnesota banks. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cha. And uh, Mr. Representative Cha renews his motion that House File 2325 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. And House File 2325 is recommended to be placed on the general register. This concludes our agenda for the evening, and so the meeting is adjourned.